All right, here's solutions to written problem three. This is one of these crazy problems where you figure out the area underneath the curve, but instead of using the methods that we'll learn later in this class, the evaluation theorem, which makes this problem fairly easy, you go through it by evaluating a limit of sums. So lots of definitions and it can feel very memorization heavy. Although when you kind of get the hang of these, they're a little bit more intuitive than maybe they seem. At any rate, one way you could start these out is first figure out delta x. So in your head, you're kind of thinking the length of the width length of the width sounds weird but whatever the length of the width of each of the different rectangles that you're going to use um, that will eventually tend towards zero and delta x is always b minus a over n and the problem they will always tell you a and b so in this case they're telling me that a is equal to one and b is equal to five that's given up here so for this specific problem i got four over n for my value of delta x and we're going to take the limit as n approaches infinity. So intuitively, you're thinking, oh, okay, this gets super small. It tends towards zero because these rectangles get really, really skinny because we want them to kind of perfectly map the area underneath the curve. Uh, the other thing that you're going to end up needing to know is a formula for xi, and that's always a plus i delta x. And so I like to figure that out right after I figure out delta x because it's used in the formula. A, again, was given to me to be 1. And i is just i, delta x is 4 over n. So we could write this as 1 plus 4i over n. And if you want, you can write the formula for rn for the area underneath a rectangle using right endpoints. Uh, but maybe I'll hold off on that. I'll say that the area underneath the curve from 1 to 5 of the curve being x cubed minus x squared. So this definite integral notation is just rewording the question here in kind of symbols. Uh, that's equal to the limit as n approaches infinity. And again, n is going to be the number of rectangles that I have that I end up using to approximate this area. So it sort of makes sense that that gets arb arbitrarily large because uh, I want to use infinitely many rectangles. And the limit of what? Well, the sum, I'm going to use right endpoints. So you could just write, maybe I'll write this. It's just rn. The limit of rn, really you can use rn or ln, it doesn't matter because when the rectangles get infinitely skinny, whether you use their right endpoint or their left endpoint of the height doesn't matter because they're infinitely skinny, so the right and the left endpoints are right on top of each other. Uh, and you don't have to write this as a separate step, but I'll leave it in there just in case it helps anybody kind of remember these formulas. Uh, rn is the sum from i equals 1 to n. That's why I prefer rn as opposed to ln. For ln, it goes from 0 to n minus 1. And I like going from 1 to n because then it matches up with these formulas later on. The sum of what? Well, to create Rn, I need to have the area of each rectangle, which is the base times the height. And so the base we already talked about was delta x, and the height is f of xi. So I'll end up using this stuff that I figured out up here. So substituting in, I'll leave my limit here and leave my sum. And then delta x is 4 over n. And f of xi, well, xi is 1 plus 4i over n. But f of x is x cubed minus x squared. So maybe I'll write this times, and that'll be my x cubed minus my x squared. And so in place of the x for x cubed, I want to write what xi is equal to, which is this 1 plus 4i over n. And same idea over here. I got a 1 plus 4i over n. And so if I could get rid of this sigma, then I could evaluate this limit. And getting rid of this sigma, well, I'll end up using these formulas. But to use these formulas, I have to have my i, my i squared, my i cubed kind of isolated. So what I have to do is get rid of these parentheses, which is kind of a pain. There are shortcut ways to expand things that are squared or cubed. Pascal's triangle comes into play. There's some kind of cool ways you can do these. Um, but I'm not going to bother with any of those tricks. I'm just going to go down to the bottom of my page here. And I'm going to figure out what 1 plus 4i over n times 1 plus 4i over n is. Because this will give me 1 plus 4i over n squared. So if I FOIL, I get a 1. I get a 4i over n, but then I get another 4i over n. So I got 8i over n. And then 4i over n times 4i over n gives me 16i squared over n squared. So this will go in place of this term. But I also need to know what 1 plus 4i over n cubed is. Uh, so maybe I can just write one more here and then multiply this answer times 1 plus 4i over n 
which is a little bit tedious, but you can do it. You take this one times all these terms. Well, one times anything is just what it's equal to. So one plus eight I over N plus 16 I squared over N squared. That's this one times this term, this term, and this term. And then this four I over N times each of these three terms. Well, let's see, four I over N times one is just four I over N. Four I over N over, times eight I over N, eight times four is 32. So I get 32 I squared over N squared. And then finally, 16 I squared over N squared times four I over N. 16 times four is what, 64? So I guess 64 I cubed, I times I squared, divided by N cubed. And then if you wanna combine like terms, uh, you can write them in increasing or decreasing order. It doesn't really matter. There's my one, eight I over N and four I over N gives me 12 I over N. And then for my squared, 16 and 32 gives me 48 I squared over N squared. And then I only have this cube term, 64 I cubed over N cubed. And now I think I can kind of substitute in the different pieces. So instead of one plus four I over N cubed, let's see if I can get it all on one screen, can write all this mess. And then instead of one plus four I over N squared, I can write this line right here. Okay, so that's kind of a lot to get here, um, but now I think we can start cleaning stuff up a little bit. I can subtract these two terms, so kind of combine like terms, and I think some of this stuff will cancel out. Let's see, one minus one is just zero, 12i over n minus eight i over n, because remember you're subtracting all three of these terms, leaves me the four i over n. 48i squared over n squared minus 16i squared over n squared is 32i squared over n squared. And then I got my 64 I cubed over N cubed. Now I can distribute this four over N through. So four over N times four I over N is 16 I over N squared. Four over N times 32 I squared over N squared is 128 I squared over N cubed, I believe. And then four over N times 64 I cubed over N cubed, four times 64 is 256. I to the fourth, nope, I to the third, N to the fourth. So the numbers are getting a little bit large, but I guess at least we've consolidated things a little bit. The nice thing about this form is we can take advantage of some properties of sigma, and we can pull constants out in front of sigmas, and we can kind of distribute sigmas to each of the different terms. So really two steps in one here. Uh, I don't know, maybe that's me getting tired. Maybe that's me assuming at this point, you can see those two steps fairly clearly, taking the constants out in front and then kind of distributing is probably the wrong verb to use there, but I think it tends to resonate with students pretty well the sigma to each of these different terms. The advantage of this is we can finally get rid of these sigmas, right? The sum from i equals one to n of i, i squared and i cubed. Those are exactly the formulas that we have up here. So now is the time, finally, that we can go and substitute those guys in. So substituting in the formulas for these different sigmas give me these guys. I'm kind of inconsistent with my colors, but I guess blue is when I kind of substitute things in. I thought about drawing arrows, but I thought that just might make this even uglier than it needs to be. Uh, and now all I have to do is evaluate this big limit. It's a little bit hard to see the limit right now. You might get to the point where you can look at this and just tell what this limit is because a lot of the stuff will end up not mattering. But being the teacher and all, I kind of feel like I should write out all the steps. So that's what I'm going to do. This 16 and this 2 cancel to give me an 8. And then I have n. Oh, this is an n plus 1. Sorry about that. I got n squared plus n divided by this n squared. For this term, the 128 divided by six is a little annoying because 128 isn't divisible by six, um, but we can reduce them, cut them both in half and make it 64 over three. And then for this polynomial up here, we've seen this a few times, the n times n plus one gives me n squared plus n. And that n squared plus n, you can foil with this two n plus one, and that leaves you with two n cubed plus three n squared plus n. And then I got the three, because remember we cut this in half, n cubed down on the bottom here. And for this last term, let's see, the two squared gives me four, and 256 divided by four is 64. And then n times n plus one is this n squared plus n here, but I have to square it. So when I get n squared plus n squared, I kind of think foil this times itself. You get n to the fourth plus two n cubed plus n squared. And all that's left on the bottom is this n to the fourth because the two squared already canceled with the two. And then often I'll write another line here distributing more, but I really don't think you have to. I think you can evaluate these limits just by looking at them. So like this first one, think about you're dividing everything by n squared. So this is gonna go away, right? Cause it'll be one over n. And when n goes towards infinity, this uh, goes towards zero. In fact, anything where you have a constant divided by an n will end up going away. 
So this term won't matter, this term, this term, this term, and this term. But anyways, if I go through them one at a time, uh, divide everything by n squared, you get a one, a zero, and a one. So eight times one over one, just gives me eight. And then for this term, dividing all these by n cubed, here's my two, zero, zero, and a three. So I get 64 times two divided by three, so 128 thirds. And then finally for this guy, this is a one, if I divide it by n to the fourth, there's a zero, a zero, and a one, so I'm left with just 64. So now the kind of annoying step where you probably just putting this into a calculator, uh, eight times six, or eight plus 64 is 72, and 72 plus 128 thirds, I don't know what that is, but if I got a common denominator of three, so there's 216 over three, plus 128 over three, I get what, 344 over three? which I believe is my final answer. As we'll later learn, you can check this fairly easily using antiderivatives. And if you've learned that and you wanna do that, feel free. Um, but I feel fairly confident in the work, so I'm gonna call this good.